I'm Nadia Bilchik, and once again, I am joined by my brothers and my sister. So this time, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves to you, starting with my sister. Hi, I'm Tanya Bilchik, and I am in Connecticut. And then Anton. I'm uh, Anton Bilchik, and I'm the Chief of General Surgery at St. John's Hospital, Providence St. John's Hospital in, in Santa Monica, and a professor of surgical oncology at the John Wayne Cancer Institute. And Brian? Hi, I'm Brian. I'm Nadia's brother. <laughs> Dr. Brian Vilchik, cardiologist, and you specialize in? Cardiology. Ah, and Tanya, by the way, <laughs> Dr. Tanya Vilchik is a neurologist. So you are joined by the three doctors and Nadia Vilcek here on Nadia Vilcek TV and Nadia speaks to her brothers and her sister. So last week we spoke about the impact that COVID-19 was having on their practices and I thought we'd go around again starting with Dr. Tanya Vilcek, the neurologist in New Haven, Connecticut, about any changes this week. Tanya, are you seeing more COVID positive patients? Are you seeing more headache patients? What are you seeing this week? I am seeing pretty much what I saw last week. My regular patients are now transferred to video visits. My injection patients are still coming into the office and they laugh at me because I am wearing a full on protective gear. I'm wearing a gown, gloves, mask, visor, shield, and it's kind of, they, they, because I'm very small, they go, oh, you're so mm -hmm. cute. But other than that, things are stable. My patients are getting more headaches as things get more anxious as they're at home. Uh, my teacher patients are especially getting lots of headaches because they're trying to do online programs for their students and they're finding it more difficult. My mom patients are finding it more difficult because they've got many children at home that they're now trying to homeschool. And my nurse patients are still working in the hospital and obviously rather anxious about what's going on. So, you know, there's definitely more anxiety going on. Dr. Anton Bilchik. Well, I think a week has been a lifetime with everything that's, that, that, that's going on. Um, there's, there continues to be huge anxiety um, in trying to make decisions as to how to manage uh, cancer patients. There's also a lot of discussion now among uh, different hospitals and medical schools as to how to reopen, what's considered safe, how testing should be done, when testing should be done, what's the best test to have, what does the testing mean? We hear a lot about antibody testing um, and the, the, the thought about antibody testing is that if in fact uh, you, you have the antibody, then you may be uh, protected um, against getting it again, and you may be protected against giving the virus to someone else. At least that's what some people think, but the more we learn about the testing, the more unclear it is. And um, ultimately, uh, we're gonna have to have a, a, a really clear understanding as to what, um, who should be tested, and what test to have. The other thing, um, you'll notice a week ago, I wasn't wearing a Band-Aid on my nose. I was gonna um, ask you about yeah, that Band-Aid. Yeah, and so the, the reason I'm wearing a Band-Aid is that this is the N95. This is the N95 mask that we're required to, to wear. And when you do um, long surgeries like I do, we have to wear the N95, and then you have to wear another mask over the N95. And you'll notice that there's a metal strip along the N95 that you have to squeeze down on your nose to get a tight fit. And what this metal does, um, especially with, if you're wearing it for a long period of time, is it actually chisels through your nose. So to, to all the people watching your show, Nadia, um, this is a great chance for people to come up with PPEs to pre prevent injury to people's faces from PPEs. You know, <laughs> what do they say? The mother of invention. Right now, people are doing all kinds of things. But yes, for you as a surgeon, that is a, a byproduct of wearing the mask. Brian, are you having to wear a mask? Tell us about your week. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the week, um, it, it's 
a little bizarre because the days seem to go really fast and at the same time they drag on. Um, the days and nights kind of meld into each other. Um, sleeping isn't always as easy as it uh, should be. Um, being in a routine is a little bit more challenging. Um, you know, there has been some progression as far as the ability to get uh, uh, equipment and, and masks are more available. We're all required in uh, our town and city, uh, in fact, our town uh, in, in Boston, the town of Brookline uh, actually mandates now wearing a mask outdoors. We've uh, instituted a mask indoor policy since uh, the hospital instituted that uh, uh, several weeks ago. So even if people are sitting around and, and are six feet away, uh, we are all wearing masks all the time. Uh, when I can close my door and be in my office, I, I'm not wearing a mask. Um, I did have a, an experience of trying to drink some tea through a mask. I uh, <laughs> forgot I was wearing it. And uh, that was kind of a, a, a interesting uh, adventure for me. Um, I, so I wore my tea. Has that not happened to anyone else? Wow. Oh, I do have to share with you all why my brother, Dr. Brian Vilchik, shares this story that when I was a young drama student and I used to go for auditions, very often in the waiting room, Dr. Brian now Vilchik, or should I say now Dr. Brian Vilchik, used to be called in for the auditions and often got a part that I didn't get. So I do want to share that with you. That, uh, he that is was quite a diversion. Brother. Thanks, Nadia. <laughs> no, so I think uh, actually... Uh, humor actually is quite important and I think uh, people are reaching out to humor in, in times of, of difficulty and uh, you know Sydenham the great philosopher said you could heal more people with a clown than an ass laden with drugs so uh, take that to your bank um, so the the issues that have changed this week um, I think there's as, as Tanya said uh, a, a tremendous amount of anxiety and, and people are starting to feel much more isolated. I think there's been so much confusion about the information that's been available to people. And uh, as it comes out and, and now we're dealing with a, you know, the, the, the leadership of the, the country uh, dealing with uh, blame game. And, and uh, one of the most awful things I learned about was the uh, acute unfunding of uh, WHO in a time when, um, you know, we're not isolated in this country. And uh, as you all know, that uh, if we don't stop the spread in other countries, it will never stop here. So until we have an immunization uh, strategy and um, or potentially therapies for this, this will keep coming back. And uh, so even if we control it acutely, um, there will be surges. And if we don't manage this in a world, uh, you know, in a global, with a global strategy, then we're uh, going to undo all the benefit we do from dealing with uh, this in the way with, that we're dealing with it. Um, so, you know, so there's a global uh, outlook on this. There's the uh, individual outlook and uh, talking to patients and doing a uh, um, virtual visits, uh, you, you get to learn a lot about people and their concerns and their fears. Um, I heard some really interesting uh, comments today, actually wrote some, some of them down. Um, one of my patients feeling like a caged animal. Uh, he feels uh, there's a, a lacking in diversion and, and it's like watching a car crash and not being able to do anything about it. Uh, one of my other patients who's a, a cancer a patient who has metastatic cancer, uh, and he says he's tired of being resilient. And in this uh, time of isolation, he feels he's the most vulnerable. Um, and yet um, he's been told he needs to uh, be resilient and he's, he's tired of that. Um, so I think people are, uh, there's a lot of fatigue that's setting in. Um, I, you know, um, I'll, I'll let others talk to that. Well, it's interesting, Brian. One of the things you've all put out is that there's a lot of misinformation out there. So for people who are watching this, at what point do you think you need a test? And then is the test available? So for example, one of the things everybody's been saying is that you don't need a test unless you have a temperature. 
Well, full transparency, my husband, Steve, did not have a temperature. I did get him a test because he was coughing. And in fact, the test has come back that he is COVID positive. Mine says negative. So can we just go back to some basics here and whoever would like to answer around, do we know that a temperature is a sign of needing a test? And then how available are tests in your specific areas? I spoke to a physician today who only has 15 tests available in his whole practice. So there's, a, there's definitely more testing available and the criteria uh, to get a test ordered uh, from our perspective is uh, changing all the time. So there is a little bit of more liberalization with testing and there's so many different tests available. So different companies have uh, created tests uh, and then hospitals have created tests and uh, there's a varying amount of accuracy of these tests. So there's a, a concern about the false negative tests and that, uh, you know, has been quoted anywhere from 10 to 30 percent uh, being false negative. Uh, the false positivity, I haven't, uh, you know, I'm sorry to hear about uh, your husband uh, being positive, but the, um, you know, the concern is, is that a, a, a true accurate test and, and who created the test and, and is it a true positive. Um, from what I've heard is that most of the positive tests are truly positive. Um, so uh, the there's a again confusing information about uh, you know uh, several weeks ago we were all told that there's going to be millions of tests available and everyone should get a test and the more testing you do the more the numbers change and uh, the more positive you have then the less people who are positive are sick with the virus so uh, if you're only testing sick people the likelihood of getting positive tests is much higher and uh, of those that are positive most people uh, get to uh, ride this out at home uh, in isolation. Um, those who are admitted to the hospital, um, they, you know, there's, there's uh, a lot of reason, most of the reasons that people are getting uh, admitted is because they're uh, short of breath. And if they're out of breath and they're hypoxemic, it's not just about the fever uh, and the chills, but they actually uh, start dropping their oxygen saturations. And if the body doesn't have enough oxygen in the system, uh, the systems start uh, failing. And so there's this acute viral infection, and then there's this inflammatory reaction to the viral infection, um, which is obviously what we're trying to um, see if we can prevent the spread of that because the, the surges to the hospital won't, you know, won't, it's not tolerable. Uh, there's a, a kind of cap on, on how many beds and, and ICU beds. And so we're trying to get this a lot before uh, that stage. Um, but yeah, the testing is, is a major issue. So Anton, I'm for you, my, yes. Yeah, I'm going to give you my um, perspective. I mean, ultimately, um, I think everyone will need to be tested. The tests will need to be really quick and they'll need to be painless. Um, the, 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 there's been discussion and it may even be available about people being able to mail in swabs or, um, you know, for, for testing. But it's so that so the test is one thing and until it's it's readily available to absolutely everyone, I think um, we need to prioritize as to who should be tested right now, um, such as you know patients with symptoms, healthcare workers. My my concern in um, someone like you being being tested when you have no symptoms. Right. Um, I, I got tested because there was a testing available. Because there was and, a testing available. Well, no, I will say I did feel a tightness in chest and I did have a sore throat. Okay. And a lot of it I understand is psychosomatic, but I wanted to be tested mainly because I wanted to make sure that if I interacted with my children, I was safe. I, and I had been concerned that my husband had a cough. Okay. I, I, I want to turn that around a little bit. Okay. Let's, let's make the assumption um, that you were just you just wanted to be tested um, and you for had no symptoms mind. at all just for peace of mind so um, anyone that uh, wants to do that has to be prepared for the results 
because if in fact um, you test positive, then you really should isolate yourself for 14 days. Um, and otherwise, um, it's irresponsible to be tested, get the result, and then not prepared to, to isolate yourself or inform everyone that you've been in contact with that you've tested positive. So I'm curious, Anton, you know, you spoke about the masks and wearing the masks. You are in a hospital where there is a vast amount of COVID positive individuals and very ill individuals. Does in fact the mask and the double layer of mask, I mean, does it really protect you? Well, I, I think that there's, there's absolutely no question that the, that the N95 um, provided it, it um, fits you well, because the whole purpose of the N95 is that nothing can sneak through it, and that's why it's uncomfortable to wear, that, that, the, that this is very, very effective against giving someone the virus, if you're, if you're a carrier, and potentially getting it if you're taking care of a, of a, of a COVID patient. Now, um, in taking care of COVID patients, the precautions are far more than just an N95 mask. And I think that the, um, you know, the, the, the healthcare workers, and again, um, I, I, we, you know, we discussed this before, I, I look at my colleagues in awe, I look at the nurses in awe, I look at the emergency room staff in awe, I look at the anesthesiologists in awe, because everyone um, is, taking, is taking a risk, um, especially not knowing if someone is COVID positive or not. Um, and yet all these people do their job, don't complain, come to work. And I think, you know, it's absolutely essential that none of the healthcare workers feel that they cannot be protected because the, these are the, you know, the, the best of the best. Now, last week you said to us that surgeries had been delayed if it wasn't considered an urgent surgery. So you are a cancer surgeon. How do you decide if somebody's tumor should be taken out now or in a month's time? So th that's why um, a week feels like an eternity because um, all elective surgeries um, around the country have been postponed. Um, and the question is, in something like cancer, um, is what is considered elective versus what is considered emergent? I mean, obviously, if someone is bleeding or they've got an intestinal obstruction, um, then that's considered um, emergency and no, one, no one's going to question the need for, um, for an operation. The challenge is in those people who can wait a week or two um, but once you start getting beyond that, there, there clearly is concern for some cancers um, that their cancers may progress, especially if they're not doing any treatment, if they're not doing chemotherapy, if they're not doing radiation therapy. So I, th th there's no question um, that the anxiety level among um, cancer patients that have, who, that, that have had their surgery um, delayed or postponed and not knowing when, none of them have been given a surgical date, um, creates a, 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 you know, a real, um, not only level of anxiety, but just this concern for both the patient and the physician that the cancer might be, might be growing. And we just, don't, we just don't know. So we're trying to, what, what, is, what has really happened again over a period of a week as we plateau um, in various different states, is many hospitals are now looking at how to introduce surgery safely. So how to be able to, to operate on these people. And what some hospitals are doing, um, I know that it's being done in, in, in Boston at um, the Massachusetts General Hospital, um, patients get, get tested. Um, couple of days before their surgery or they, they get tested um, even the day of surgery if, if necessary um, so that the, the staff and the operating room team know whether the patient is COVID positive or not. So I think that, you know, the, the, we will, um, things I, I, I suspect over the next couple of weeks will start opening up 
for surgery, but, but hospitals are going to be enormously cautious. Um, there's going to be, there, there is no such thing as normal anymore. And so um, what about the financial implications for a hospital, for an institution? So obviously these surgeries bring in an enormous amount of income or even colonoscopies. I mean, what happens in terms of those and the long-term financial impact? The long-term financial impact is severe because most hospitals um, support the um, support the hospital through procedures and especially surgical procedures. So um, part of this, um, yeah, part of the two trillion dollar funding. Um, is to support hospitals and to try and, um, you know, support um, some some doctors to keep them from uh, not having to lay off staff and be, being able to continue practicing. There's so many different practice models within the country. You have private practice, you have doctors that that work for for hospitals or medical groups. Everyone is being impacted. But there is my my, my sense is that. Um, th there is a huge level of anxiety among hospital systems that if this carries on much longer, then there will be layoffs. There, there, there will be a moratorium on, on hiring new, new doctors. Um, some doctors may need to take pay cuts. There's already discussion at some hospitals about no, you know, a whole restructuring of bonus incentives, incentives and things like that. So financially, um, both hospitals and physicians um, are most definitely going to feel it. And, and the longer this continues, the worse it's going to get. So Tanya, for you, and just switching tracks for a moment, I understand, and again, a lot of information and misinformation out there, that headache, severe headache, is in fact one of the symptoms. Is that yeah. true? Are you experiencing that? And how do we know if our headache is an alarm bell to get tested? I think you have to look at all the symptoms. If you're a headache person, and in fact, I just spoke with one of my patients today who is a headache sufferer. She has chronic migraine and she developed a viral infection. And again, this comes down to the testing. She was told oh, it's most likely Corona or COVID-19, but you know, we don't, we don't, we have not availability for testing or you don't want to leave your house or whatever reason. And of course, once the viral illness is in its peak, our headaches are significantly worse. So for patients with pre-existing headache conditions, they obviously get worse during a time of anxiety. They also get worse during a time of infection. However, you can't just say an isolated headache is a symptom of the virus because you have to look at everything in context. You have to look at all the other symptoms. So headache may be one of them, but there are so many other symptoms that go along with a complex viral infection. If somebody just came with a brand new headache and they said, I need to be tested for Corona, I've got a bad headache, that doesn't really fit the profile. You've got to be sick. And headache is just one of the many symptoms. So there are reasons why headaches are worse. Headaches can be worse if you're stressed. Headaches can be worse if you're constantly looking at a screen and you know, certain wavelengths of light are a huge migraine trigger and a huge headache trigger. And if you're looking at a screen, instead of moving around your office, you're gonna get more headaches. And so I think you've gotta be really careful in saying isolated headache is the only symptom. I think you've gotta look at the complexity of symptoms. So it's an interesting time in that you are actually going through what many of your patients are going through in terms of the anxiety, the stress. In that way, it's quite unprecedented. So, you know, Brian, starting with you, your lessons from this and advice and guidance that you are giving your patients? The advice is so different depending on who the patient is and where they are. And there's, there's you know, across the board, there's, there's a, obviously a disproportionate uh, uh, effect of uh, illness and pre-existing conditions on, on people who are in, in lower socioeconomic uh, states. And, um, you know, when and, the, and there's a lot more crowding. And uh, so it, it's a lot more challenging with people who have uh, less and less access and uh, those who don't have uh, easy access to food um, and shopping and, um, you know, 
finances. Um, the common theme, however, is that of the sense of feeling uh, isolated and lonely, and especially in our older patients who, um, you know, if they're in any kind of facility or nursing home or assisted living facility, um, you know, they're, they're being um, really isolated and, and physically isolated and socially isolated, and they don't necessarily they're not as facile with technology, um, although some of them are incredibly facile, uh, but generally they're the ones who are suffering tremendously. Um, and there's a fear of uh, people's families who can't have access to their, um, their loved ones, their, their family. And, and uh, just uh, Yesterday, I had a patient of mine who, who died, and he died alone, and he was in his 80s, and um, his family couldn't visit, and he had pre-existing cardiac issues, but he died of uh, COVID-19 um, complications uh, of such, and the older patients do not do as well. Um, so... The advice for most of my patients who are, you know, not sick currently or who have cardiac conditions is really try to be organized, try to stay in some sort of structure. I think uh, we discussed this a little bit last week, the importance of having a routine, um, you know, not binge watching uh, too much and, and then not sleeping at night and sleeping during the day and um, you know eating habits change uh, tremendously and um, the ability to exercise and how to be creative with exercise. So please with exercise please show us your exercise background just show us what we should be doing. Which, which one? The one of the rowing you see Brian is uh, tech savvy so let's show the rowing just as a bit of inspiration for today while you get the rowing going there we go. So you're telling us that's what we should one be doing our, every day. One of our uh, exercise stress tests um, on a rower. But um, the idea is that one should be in a routine. One should spend the time and carve out time every day for physical activity and 20 to 30 minutes and you can be quite creative and you can turn on music and you can dance. Uh, families can dance and we've, we need to bring in uh, a, a little bit more uh, fun and positive things and, and people have a lot more time on their hands and they have time on their hands to reflect and potentially uh, learn about uh, mind body uh, issues and the relationship and cognitive behavioral therapies and um, I hope that's not too distracting behind me. So no, but I just... am thinking that the next Doctors Vilchik and Nadia call, we need to show you our dance video. So <laughs> any anything of that, you dancing, I love it. Anton, just advice, guidance to people right now. Um, I think it's important for every person to know that they're not alone and that we are going to get through it. It's um, there, there's there's a definite light at the end of uh, at the end of the tunnel, and people need to take in addition to exercise and eating correctly and eating healthy, um, need to take advantage of um, certain chat rooms, websites that they can interact with with. Uh, so, in, for example, in in in, um, in colon cancer or pancreas cancer, there are such um, strong networks of patients that are going through experiencing exactly what what they're experiencing and i think it's one thing to hear it from a doctor you know you will be fine or uh, we will see you soon but it's another thing hearing it from another person who's going through with the same disease that's going through what you're going through so i think that many of the um cancer organizations and many cancer institutes have really encourage these chat rooms um, as, as a way of providing providing support. But, but ultimately, um, I think again, this is, if there is another light, um, is we've, we've learned a new way of practicing medicine. We've learned a new way of communicating. Now, um, and, and that really, um, you know, refers to um, telemedicine. Now, telemedicine itself is, is not a new concept. It's been around for a long time. 
what's new is people like me that have never used it until until covid and i've found that i can now talk to people um whether i'm, I'm at home i'm at work um we can uh, be um we, we can find times that are convenient and i never thought that i would use um telemedicine as a way to to communicate and the more i do it uh, the more I realize that it's providing um, it's providing me more access and it's providing patients more access. And so even once this COVID crisis is over, that form of communication um, for people like me who you know, just haven't done it before is going to be a very powerful tool. So I think there's a lot that we're, we're learning from this and there's a lot that we're going to take from this crisis to improve the way we take care of patients moving forward. Tanya, you mentioned that last week you said mm. that you've got people in different uh, states, in different cities, who you now have access to for you advice and guidance to your patients who are predominantly many of them headache sufferers. Yeah, no, I'm actually a headache specialist. So I ditto Anton's recommendation of the social media and the big groups, the American Headache Society, the American Migraine Foundation. And you know, a lot of people have Facebook groups, web groups. I think you do have to be mindful though, that there can be misinformation within those groups. And I've heard all sorts of lovely rumors about medications that I recommend. And then patients will go, well, I'm very reluctant to take that because I read on Facebook that it causes hair loss or I heard that that does it. So I do think you need to get your information from an authority or a really positive, good organization. As I said, for me, it's the American Headache Society, the American Migraine Foundation. There are wonderful, very well vetted groups that give good quality information. I also think that I've learned a lot. I mean, I have patients this week that I spoke to in Vermont, in Florida, in California, and it's been very interesting because I've learned how to do a neurological exam on the television, on the video. And I've learned how I've seen people, pets, I've heard lots of children in the background. I understand a lot of the stresses. And in fact, while I was doing videos this morning, video conferencing with my patients, I had a cat walk across and, you know, it was kind of, you know, fun for the patients. They, 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 they see me as a human. Not as so Tanya, when you learn how to do together. when you learn how to do surgery on a video, will you let me know? <laughs> I will. In fact, it's so funny that you said that because I do a lot of photos for my chronic migraine patients, and um, somebody asked me how was I going to be able to continue to do Botox, and I said, well, actually, I'm just going to take a picture. I'm going to teach the patients how to do it themselves. I'll send the Botox to their houses, and they can inject themselves. So uh, yes. yeah, no, you have to be able to do your procedures in your office with your very good protective equipment. So just a question. I mean, if we had Dr. Anthony Fauci on this call with us right now, anything any to ask him or any to say to him? You know, I think that it is all said on multiple television channels all the time. And so I certainly don't think that I'm an expert enough in any field to ask anybody those kind of questions. Thoughts, Anton? Yeah, I, I would just say that, I mean, I've been involved in um, academic medicine now for 25 years, and I've been involved in writing research grants to the National Cancer Institute and um, the National Institute of Health. And Dr. Fauci is a legend. He's an absolute legend. You will not find any doctor or scientist in the country that doesn't say how much that how, what, what high regard they have for him and all i would say is everyone needs to listen to him um his his advice is is, is sage he he has the country's best interest at heart and he he's in a very very challenging position because he's focusing on what is what is best to save lives and there are others that are focusing purely on the economy. Thoughts, so, Brian? Any last thoughts, Dr. Fauci, or otherwise? No, I, I just echo what uh, Anton said. It's, um, you know, he's been remarkably um, calm uh, in 
in his position because he has to play the politics. And this should not be a partisan issue. I, this should not be a blame game issue. Um, and truly this is national safety. And if we can't come together and figure this out, um, it's gonna cost a lot more lives and the economy is not gonna be helped by that. Um, you, you saw the demonstrations in Michigan um, and that was so unfortunate where there's so many people who are trying to do the right thing. And, and uh, as I said, are, you know, sacrificing by self-isolating and that there are others who will jeopardize all the goodness that people have uh, tried to do. So I think that comes from, you know, uh, leadership and trying to have a cohesive, integrative, uh, facilitative leadership rather than a, a dictatorial one where um, there are, you know, uh, other um, economic and, and uh, fiscal incentives rather than the health of the nation. I think Fauci has done an amazing job uh, at keeping his job, uh, despite, mm -hmm. you know, challenges. challenges so yes. as we end this conversation, and I'm going to give everybody a chance, is there anything else you would like to ask each other? Is there anything else you would like to say? And for the purposes of those of you who have taken the time to watch this, we will be checking in with each other. So mm -hmm. last thoughts, anything, Brian, you'd like to share last yeah, ideas? I, I just wanted to say it, it's, uh, you know, none of these uh, presentations are scripted or rehearsed and uh, it's just a little spontaneous and a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, again, for us as a family to connect in a way that we've not before. And uh, there's a little humor, there's a little uh, seriousness. I think we all care deeply about each other and, and for us to have this time, um, you know, initially felt a little awkward and then uh, kind of felt important for us to, to, you know, even if we, what we're saying isn't eloquent and, and uh, um, you know, there's stuttering and there's uh, uh, pregnant pauses. I, I think just this ability for Speak us to, <laughs> <laughs> what the pregnant pause or the stuttering and the um, I have the to eloquence. say, I think you're all marvelously eloquent. So, you know, and I think, you know, just the, the concept of it doesn't have to be perfect. We just want to connect with each other. We don't have to look good. We, our backgrounds don't have to be fancy. We just need to be real and connect and reach out and know what each other is going through. So thank you, Nadia, for uh, putting us together, um, you know, and we are in such disparate areas of the United States with different professions and, and yet we have uh, so much commonality and, and the again the the inner feeling of wanting to be involved in each other's lives and, and what matters and be connected is uh, a, a blessing thank you well it's so interesting because i had a beautiful conversation with someone who knew brian vilchik and was saying what an outstanding physician he is i was always concerned that when people walked in he looked far too young but Brian, you, you're aging nicely. Not anymore. And, <laughs> and some I, for you. I, I just want to add one, one thing to my very, very articulate brother. It's, it's, it's often hard to, to follow him because um, he has a way of putting it all together and, and capturing the, the human side of things um, in, a, in a very articulate way. But I think one of the wonderful things of doing this is that we have an 82-year-old mom who's isolated in South Africa. And I know that um, when this is done, this will get sent to her to see. And I know that she will watch this many, many, many times with a lot of you know, pride. I mean, there's, there, there, there's this anxiety that we all share that we don't know when we're gonna be able to travel to, to see her next. And uh, the fact that she gets so excited to see all of us communicating and interacting and that we all have an opinion and a perspective is another reason why I think this is so special. Excellent. She did, was... she did criticize us, each of us. <laughs> well, she did? So oh, just yeah. so you know, I always tell people, and this will help you, Tan and, and Brian, is if I was ever on CNN and made a mistake, no one would notice except for mom. So mom, this particular program is for you this week. It's for you and for your 82nd birthday. Tan, last thoughts, anything you yeah. want to add? No, I think Anton is 100% correct. I think that family is really important. And at a time like this, we realize 
how important your siblings are. Yes, we've all got wonderful, great careers. We've done really well, considering we all came kind of as immigrants with pretty much nothing but our really good education. And I mean, it is wonderful to have everybody connect. I will also add that we are very privileged to be here and living where we are and knowing that we're safe and knowing that the supermarkets still have food and reading about what's going on in South Africa. And they are taking this incredibly seriously with the lockdown. And I think that, you know, as tough as this is for us all here and for our patients and for everybody in our communities, it is so much harder when you don't have this ability to connect with everybody via media like we're doing now. So as you said, my mom will love watching this and everybody else that's around her, but you all have to feel for the people in South Africa that are under significant lockdown without all the facilities that we've got to cope with this. And that's why they have to take the shutdown and the lockdown so seriously because the healthcare system there would not be able to sustain the outbreak that we're getting at the moment. Doctors Tanya Bilchik, Anton Bilchik, and Dr. Brian Bilchik. All I can say is I look forward to catching up with you again next week. And from me, Nadia Bilchik, and the three doctors Bilchik, stay safe, stay strong, and stay sane. Look forward to sharing this with you again soon. And, and connected. And connected. Final thing, Tanya says, Tan, say cheers. Cheers. Hey, and it's five cheers. o'clock on the East Coast. And cheers. Cheers. And Brian. Jay. Cheers. And Nadia Bilchik, we hope to bring you some more exciting. Well, let's hope in a week's time there is some progress and something exciting to share. Cheers.